So welcome everyone. It's absolutely fantastic to see everyone in person today. I've been so excited for us to have a um, in-person meeting. So we've had a few virtual events in, in the last few years, but I, I can't tell you how happy I am to see everyone together today. Um, and may this be the start of more to come as well. Um, so by way of not introduction, I'm Andrea Hunt. I'm a partner in BSNO, and I look after our service charge accounting services across the UK. And we've got a number of our colleagues here today as well, um, not just from BSO, but from our wider real estate sector. So welcome to everyone. Great opportunity for you to, to meet everybody and network. Um, before I introduce you to our two speakers today, I just wanted to cover a couple of admin items. There are no known fire drills, and so if the fire alarms do go off, then please just make your way out through the exits that you came, down the stairs and out onto Baker Street, and we'll guide you from there. Um, I've already mentioned about the session being recorded, and I think also that we really welcome your feedback from these events. Um, we also love ideas about future subject matters to be covered, so we will be sending you a link along with a copy of the slides. So please feel free to share your feedback and your ideas for future events. We've got lots of speakers internally and externally that we can bring to meet you all. OK, so if we make a start, um, I'm really excited with our speakers today. Um, it gives me great joy to be able to introduce Clarinda and Sally. Um, our session today is to focus on anti-money laundering, suspicious activity reports and fraud in the real estate sector. Um, so the session will cover the, the recent media spotlight on money laundering in the real estate sector and the risks and threats associated with this. Um, the new incoming UK government platform for suspicious activity reporting and how and when this should be used and the importance of understanding the fraud risk, particularly to your business and why the cost of fraud is far more than the financial loss. So I'm introducing you to Clarinda Grundy, a senior manager in our economic crime team, and Sally Felton, a director from our forensic team. So I'm going to hand over to both of these ladies. Um, look forward to the session um, and I'll say some closing comments at the end. Thank you very much. Alex. <laughs> There we go, I can do it manually. Uh, thank you, already talked to that bit. There we go. Uh, morning all. Uh, yeah, as Andrea mentioned, uh, my name's Corinda. I sit within our economic crime advisory team um, here in our London BDO office. Um, within the team, I lead our real estate opposition from a financial crime perspective. So that covers everything from money laundering, terrorist financing, sanctions, um, anti-bribery and corruption, market abuse, all sorts. Um, the main topic I'll talk about today with you guys is the anti-money laundering regime. Um, my entire career has been consultancy, so not just within the real estate sector, um, but advising clients uh, across a wealth of different sectors, um, including financial services, gaming and betting, legal, etc. Um, and I help clients on um, largely reactive matters, so when things have gone wrong, um, but also on proactive enhancements to, to, to make their frameworks better. Um, I'll let Sally introduce herself as well. Thanks. Hi, I'm Sally Felton. I uh, work in forensic. I um, am a fraud risk advisor. So I try to work with clients to talk to them about the importance of stopping fraud rather than investigating fraud. I've been working for since about 1842, it feels like. <laughs> I've been working since 1987. Um, I spent 25 years at HSBC and in the last 10 years I've worked mostly in consulting roles. Although it took a lot of convincing that anybody would actually want my opinion, because in my head I'm still 17 and I don't own a sofa. Um, but obviously I've moved on a lot since then. So consequently, um, my 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 experience is broad. Um, I work across lots of different sectors, and I'm I'm not an expert in this field in your field at all. But I am an expert in trying to stop fraud, and fraudsters don't sit at home and go. Do you know what? We're not going to target the estate agents because they're really nice. Of course they don't. So my job is to kind of elevate the issue of fraud with you, to so you can understand how it how it might what it might look like in your business, and the importance of respond being able to respond to it. But I'm going to get let Clarinda go first, and I'm not going to stand and look at you. Um, so before I go into today's agenda in a bit more detail, I just thought we'd talk for a second about kind of why we're here today. 
Um, it's no surprise that property, uh, the property sector, the real estate sector in general, um, tends to be attributed uh, to financial crime in some way or another. We see it in the media every day. That's not something that's new to us. Um, and it's also not something that's new generally on a global scale across other different sectors. Um, the regulatory scrutiny on this continues to be very high. We've seen lots of fines um, in all sorts of different sectors, and that's not anticipated to slow down anytime soon. Um, just to, to bring that stat in, it's actually changed over the last couple of days. I did these slides about a week ago, and of course, they're now out of date. So um, just to sort of bring in some numbers, um, the anti-money laundering fines uh, levied this year, um, the, the £300,000 is now to date is now over half a million pounds worth just for anti-money laundering payments in the real estate uh, estate agency sector alone. So hopefully, for those of you who are fans of numbers, um, that kind of gives a bit of an indication of, of what we're doing here today. Uh, in terms of what we're going to talk about, Andrea kindly gave us a very high level summary, um, but I'm going to talk you through a little bit about um, the AML legislation in the UK and what that might mean to you in your everyday roles. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about key risks um, from a money laundering perspective that you might face uh, within your within your jobs and some of the controls and types of mitigation of those risks. And then finally, I'm going to move on to the suspicious activity reporting regime in the UK, um, why it's important um, for everybody, and try and provide some sort of practical tips and lessons learned that I've been seeing um, from the work that I do within the sector. And then I'm going to move on um, and hand over to Sally, who's going to talk a little bit about the types of fraud that you might see um, through your day jobs. Um, big focus on, on that cost of fraud piece, and we're not just talking the financial cost there. Um, and then finally, again, sort of that practical tips around creating a, a robust framework. We will leave a little bit of time at the end for questions, but if there's anything that's absolutely burning as we go through, we will try and look up. So if, if there's anything that you want to interject with, it'd be great to make this more of a, a discussion as we go. So starting with um, anti-money laundering, I just want to sort of level set us all. Um, to start with in this session. I'm conscious that we've got quite a diverse um, range of firms within, within this session today. Um, and first, I wanted to talk a little bit about the main money laundering regulations within the UK, and this is the anti-money laundering regulations. They have quite a lengthy title, um, which is put up there, but I will refer to them as the money laundering regulations because it's much, much shorter than what you see up there on screen. Now, some of your firms will be in scope for this, some won't, and I'll talk to that in a little bit more detail later. Um, don't worry if you're not in scope for it, you still have money laundering obligations, and it's still really useful for you to be here today. What the money laundering regulations basically mean um, is that firms within scope have greater um, obligations when it comes to money laundering prevention. So the expectations are just that degree higher. So the money laundering regulations have been applicable for estate agency businesses for quite a long time now, and letting agency businesses for a slightly shorter time, so as of about two and a half years ago. And I've put a little bit of a definition there, I'll, I'll let you all read that, I won't read it out what's on the slide, um, as to what lettings agents and estate agents means in the context of that particular regulation. Now, some of you are probably thinking, no, nope, that, that doesn't apply to me, that doesn't apply to what I do, um, which is absolutely fine. Um, if you don't fall within the scope of the money laundering relation, the regulations, you might just not have that additional um, obligation, but you will still be subject to the UK Proceeds of Crime Act, which is acronym to POCA or POCA, um, depending on how you like to pronounce it. And this is applicable to all um, firms in the UK, not just the real estate sector and property sector, but for the much wider remit. This contains um, the different types of money laundering offences. Uh, it also contains the requirements to report um, suspicions, which is slightly different whether you're regulated or not regulated, which I'll touch upon later. But this sort of second piece is applicable to everybody. So that's why I sort of said at the start that even if you're not in scope of the money laundering regulations, hopefully today will still be of some use to you. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, money laundering risk from a UK perspective um, and starting with the UK's national risk assessment. So this is an assessment that's done every couple of years um, by the UK government and it focuses exclusively on, on anti-money laundering um, and the risks that, that our economy in the UK faces. Um, there was one undertaken in 2017 and then another one in 2020, probably going to be another one next year, but that's not come out yet, so I can't talk to it yet. 
Um, but I thought it was interesting to, to think about the property sector and how the risk um, has changed. So putting these stats and, and uh, apologies for those um, with, with um, challenging uh, challenges seeing these colours, I find it a bit challenging to look at. Um, I think what I wanted to demonstrate here is that the property sector, as you can see from 2017 to 2020, in property estate agency and lettings agency, um, the risk level from a money laundering perspective has increased. Um, so that's that's something that our UK government has has um, concluded based on their evaluation. So that for me really brings home why it's important that we're all here today um, and we pay attention to this particular topic area. In terms of some of the drivers of those, I'm not going to read through all of these, but the property sector in general um, tends to be considered higher risk due to the, the large volume of funds um, being exchanged and also the flow of international funds. Estate agency, um, again, uh, large volume of funds, often funds coming from international, especially if we think of things like the London property market. Um, and what's interesting from the estate agency side is often um, client money isn't being handled, but the estate agent in question has a, a deep knowledge um, about both sides of the, the transaction. And then finally, thinking about lettings agency, um, this is quite an interesting area for me because it's, it's sort of considered newly regulated from a money laundering perspective um, as of January 2020. Um, again, similar, similar kind of risks, but obviously in lettings agency, the, the transactional frequency is much more often um, so that the flow of funds is happening more frequently um, and, and the handling of client money is undertaken by lettings agency firms. The point at the bottom I find quite interesting too, in terms of uh, criminal organisations can sort of set up a structure where landlord and tenant know each other um, and use a sort of sham relationship um, to try and funnel um, illicit funds, making them, them seem legitimate in a sort of rental um, situation. So that's everything from a, a UK perspective, but I really wanted to get across in this presentation that this isn't just a UK, um, a UK focused presentation. This is a really big global issue. Um, and earlier this year, the Financial Action Task Force, um, acronym of FATF, uh, they produced the first risk assessment, um, risk based approach guidance for the real estate sector. They've never done one of those before. They've done it for lots of other different sectors, but not this particular sector and it's really interesting because they've called out on a global scale that actually it's really important for this sector to understand um, about the risks of money laundering and the controls that need to be in place to prevent it. I'm going to just focus on that that word in a second so risk-based approach guidance. Um, I'm not sure of the familiarity in this room with that term. Um, it's quite a, a sort of um, techie term for some of us. Essentially, this means um, apportioning your, your resources to the areas that, um, that hold the highest level of risk. I'll touch upon that in a little bit more detail when I talk about controls on the next slide. As Sally kind of mentioned in her fraud intro, criminals unfortunately do not sit there thinking, oh, those guys look really nice. We're not going to we're not going to target them. Unfortunately, cr criminals seek to target sectors that they feel um, have a perceived easy route in. Um, and so it was quite interesting to see that the, the particular guidance uh, published by FATF kind of suggested that there may be a bit of a knowledge gap in, in the real estate sector. And what it wanted to do with this guidance was bring out um, how those gaps could be addressed to, um, to enhance the knowledge within the sector. So some of the things that they brought out, and I've touched upon all of these already, uh, you'll see some duplication. So that risk of overseas funds, um, particularly coming in from players who um, may have political exposure. Um, so they might uh, be in a position of power and able to funnel funds gained through corruption uh, within to the UK market. A lot of opaque structures involved in transactions. Um, so things like corporate vehicles, which can be used legitimately for things like tax, uh, tax planning and, and tax structuring. But sometimes by criminal organisations, they can also be used to mask uh, illicit funds um, and, and criminal behaviour. Similarly, complex contracts, often there may be multiple parties involved in real estate transactions, um, which just sort of obfuscates the, the flow of funds and it makes it very difficult to understand where money is actually coming from and where it's going to. 
moving slightly into, into Sally's fraud world, um, the use of false documents. Um, so fraudulently obtained ID documents or forged documents and also documentation which talks to um, how an individual or an entity has, has um, derived its, its funds or its, or its wealth. And this has only been exacerbated by COVID right where everything um, is done online. But we very, very rarely do things like this where we meet humans face to face. Um, penultimately, payment method. Um, the FATF call out not necessarily so much in the UK, but in other jurisdictions, still a high prevalence of the use of cash and other untraceable uh, methods of payment. Obviously, the big the big term at the moment is crypto. Um, so that the risks of kind of that and that untraceability, um, which could lead to uh, to a lot of money laundering. And then finally, um, the FATF call out this typology of, of discrepancies. So this would be uh, where a, a particular um, buyer institution um, purchases a property. So, for example, maybe a huge warehouse because they say that they want to um, they want to store all of their inventory. But then it transpires that actually this company is a cloud computing company. So why on earth would they need a giant warehouse? So it's sort of about digging deep and understanding does this does this property or real estate transaction make commercial logical sense. So I guess I've spoken a lot about, about risks and that wasn't meant to be um, too scary, um, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about controls um, and the controls that are expected to be in place. These actually tend to apply to property sector, real estate sector, but also many other sectors um, within the, the economy. Um, and so the good thing is, I guess, from a practitioner perspective, is that uh, there's a lot of parallels that we can draw and lessons that we can learn um, from other sectors who may be slightly more mature, mature on the learning curve. So I want to take a couple of these. I'm not going to go into a load of details. If you have questions at the end, please feel free to fire away. Um, but just wanted to touch on a couple of these. So I was already mentioned risk based approach. In terms of doing due diligence, it's really important in this sector in particular to understand who your client is. Um, you know, their identity, also the identity of any beneficial owners if they're a corporate entity. Um, and understanding where does their money come from and does that make legitimate sense, um, both from a, a, a party perspective, i.e. third parties, but also from a jurisdictional perspective. If their money's coming in from a foreign jurisdiction, well, why is that? Does that make logical sense based on their business model, etc.? Um, thinking about governance and oversight. Uh, there should be um, senior management input, especially in decisions that, that involve a higher level of risk. Um, so senior management should be actively involved in the financial crime risk management strategy, um, rather than just sort of sitting above it and expecting people on the ground to do the work. And then finally, moving on to training and awareness. Um, there's lots of third party vendors who provide sort of generic anti-money laundering financial crime training, and that's great. Um, but typically, we tend to find the best training is um, relating to your business specifically. So what are the typologies, what are the risks that are specific to the type of business that you do, um, the jurisdictions that you operate in, the products and the services that you offer? Um, and actually, do those, do those training modules bring the training to life? Um, is it useful? Is it memorable? Are people on the ground going to understand how that applies to their actual role? Thinking then about two other concepts. Now, these aren't, aren't necessarily controls per se, but they're absolutely um, sort of staple things that are, are really valuable um, when trying to, to mitigate risk. So the first, the first one of these being um, proactivity and compliance culture. Um, often we hear uh, in, in the sector that I work in predominantly uh, of financial services, which is this sort of um, compliance versus profit. Compliance can be seen as a cost um, in some circumstances, but actually, and Sally will talk to this a lot more in her presentation, actually um, th that cost of compliance versus the, the impact that it could have um, on your profits the things to go wrong, it's a real difficult balance to get. Um, and then finally, thinking about collaboration, um, and by that I mean on an internal uh, level, so your business teams working with your compliance teams, everybody singing off the same hymn sheet and having the same approach, um, and the same sort of ethos and ethics with regards to money laundering compliance, but also thinking about collaboration from um, more of an external perspective. So having that open two-way dialogue with regulators, with industry peers, as you're doing now, what's working, what's going wrong, what are the challenges, how can we communally 
um, fix these problems rather than kind of working in silence. And my final point on this slide that I wanted to talk to uh, is escalation and reporting. Um, so this is where you've identified something that seems a bit dodgy, seems a bit fishy, and what do you do about it? And that leads very nicely into my final section of what I'm going to talk about in terms of suspicious activity reporting. So to touch on this very briefly before um, I hand over to Sally to talk about fraud, I just wanted to spend a little time covering what SARS are um, and what they're not, I guess. Um, so SARS are a report of, of knowledge or suspicion about money laundering that you submit to our government so that they can um, investigate it further. Um, they can share either domestically or, or further afield, and it really helps that sort of global um, financial crime prevention effort. Um, they're a really vital intelligence source, not just about financial crimes, but also about underlying offences. So things like drug traffic, trafficking, narcotics trafficking, all sorts of nasty things that happen in the world um, that we don't like to think about, but obviously it's really key to preventing them. It also provides intelligence that otherwise wouldn't be gained by the, the government. Obviously, you're all sitting in your institutions. You develop a wealth of data and information and intelligence that if it's not sort of shared um, structured uh, in a structured manner externally, um, our government and our law enforcement agencies would not know about it. It's probably important to point out here that a SAR is not a crime report. This isn't um, if somebody breaks into your house, <laughs> the sort of thing that you do when you phone the police and go, there's been a burglary. A SAR is a professional report of knowledge or suspicion that you gain in your course of business. A couple of practicalities, they're submitted on an online platform to our UK, UK Financial Intelligence Unit, which sits in the National Crime Agency. Um, can do it manually, but it tends to not be encouraged. I don't really know many people who do things paper-based these days. Um, and then in addition to um, the NCA having access to these, as Irina mentioned, they, they SARS are used by lots of other um, authoritative bodies and intelligence agencies um, to help with prevention of financial crime, to identify typologies and emerging risks, and generally keep the world a little bit safer. I know some people are probably a fan of numbers, and I've already used one, and I promise this statistic is um, correct. <laughs> uh, it's slightly out of date because uh, the uh, NCA hasn't produced uh, more recent figures, but just to give you a sense of how many SARS are submitted over a period of about a year, um, not just from your sector, but across all the sectors in the UK, but that's quite a big number, over half a million um, SARS submitted. And just to touch upon, um, I guess, some practicalities, um, so at the moment, the government is trialling a new platform to make um, SAR submitting better um, for everybody involved. And I'll talk to that in a second. It's not live yet. We're hoping it's going to go live in the next month or two. It's currently in, in sort of beta testing. Um, but the real big thing about that is it's, it's meant to make it easier from a user perspective. So for inputting the information, but also from a back end, the whole purpose of this new platform is to make SARS more usable. Because at the end of the day, if a SAR isn't us usable, it's kind of worthless submitting it. So um, keep an eye out for when that new platform is, is coming live. Now, I mentioned that um, before um, poker, um, so there's a requirement under poker to, uh, to file SARS to the FIU um, relating to money laundering. Um, the Terrorist Act, uh, and attacked. Uh, there's also obligations for firms in the UK to file um, reports about suspected terrorist financing there. I mentioned sort of at the start of what I was saying is that there's a slight variance depending on whether you're in scope for the money laundering regulations or not. And I'm conscious within this room there'll be a bit of a split. Um, so I wanted to cover both sides. Uh, so if you are in the regulated sector, uh, you must submit a start of poker when you know, suspect or have reasonable grounds to know or suspect money laundering, finding a SARS attacked um, when you believe or suspect terrorist financing. You're also obliged to um, appoint a nominated officer role, and this particular individual, it's their responsibility to um, take any internal escalations, look into them and determine whether a SAR should be filed or not. Um, firms out of scope for the money laundering regulations, which I know some of those will sit in this room today, um, Quite similar obligations, especially from a tax perspective, it's still that believe or suspect terrorist financing. 
the obligation for money laundering is slightly reduced. Um, so the obligation is to report when you know or suspect. And then finally, the appointment of a nominated officer is not absolutely uh, vital, but a lot of firms tend to do it as a matter of good practice, or at least appoint an individual who internal escalations go to, um, just so there's one person with that, that responsibility from a consistency perspective. Final point I wanted to make this slide, and I promise I'm not trying to scare all of you. Um, failing to disclose, whether you're in the regulated sector or the non-regulated sector, um, is an offence, a failing to disclose offence, and it is punishable by prison time and slash or an unlimited fine. So this isn't a nice to have, this is an absolute must have, which is why I wanted to spend a bit of time talking about it in this presentation today. I'll try not to talk about prison too much more in this presentation. <laughs> Um, so final bit from me before I hand over to Sally, um, some of the top tips and these I, I wanted to bring in as kind of lessons learned from what I see both in the property sector, um, but also in other sectors because SARS are, um, are required across all sectors. So I thought that maybe I could bring a bit of wealth of knowledge from, from other sectors as well to, to try and help you guys out. So six top tips for, for filing a good, a good quality SAR. Um, First of all, determining whether activity is actually suspicious. Something I hear all the time from clients is, is the question of, oh, well, um, I, my client has started using crypto, so I'm going to file a SAR. Well, OK, crypto is inherently slightly high risk, but does that mean there's a suspicion of money laundering? Not necessarily. <laughs> so it's really getting to grips with actually, is this activity do I consider it suspicious? Do I have knowledge or suspicion that there might be money laundering involved? Or has my client just decided to do something a bit new? Um, second one is setting out um, reasons for suspicion in plain English and simple language. So um, the NCA, the recipients of SARS, do not work in your departments. You probably like video, use thousands of acronyms and have internal ways of describing things that you know very well. Um, but to a third party reading those, they probably have no idea what you're talking about. So the best tip I can give is just setting out the scene, go through in chronological order what series of events has happened that have led you to, to either have or, or have suspicion or know that money laundering or terror financing is actually taking place. Um, they're not expecting you to write war and peace, um, but the more detail that you can provide, um, kind of the better with these sort of things. This leads really nicely into that third point of providing complete and accurate information. It probably goes without saying, um, but if you miss details, you can send law enforcement down the complete wrong track. Um, so, for example, if you cite the wrong jurisdiction or you cite the wrong currency um, or the wrong amounts, if you add an extra zero or accidentally take off a zero, that can be really hindering to the, to the investigative process and really doesn't help in terms of defining typologies and supporting that global financial crime prevention um, strategy. <clears throat> Submission in a timely manner. Now, <laughs> process of crime acting TAC don't specify how long you should take to file a SAR. They um, are a bit grey. They say you should file a SAR as soon as practicable. Now, what does that mean? Um, basically, as soon as you can. Um, so SARS should be treated as a, an urgent priority. So internal escalations should be investigated promptly and a decision should be taken um, as promptly as possible. It shouldn't be something that sits in your inbox for two weeks um, and you do it on a Friday afternoon when you kind of got through the rest of your to-do list. It should be as soon as practical. Again, so that we can keep that trajectory and momentum um, of actually getting on top of typologies and prevent, uh, potentially preventing crime rather than just reacting to crime. Um, penultimately, record retention. So it's really important that records are maintained relating to SARS submitted, but also SARS not submitted. So if, um, and hopefully it wouldn't happen, but if there is ever a sort of prosecution case, um, law enforcement might come into an organisation and say, OK, show me your SAR log um, and show me how you decided that actually this activity wasn't worthy of a SAR, whereas this other activity was worthy of a SAR. So there should be that sort of um, audit trail of the decision making that took place, what investigation happened, who was involved, how was the decision taken and who approved the decision. It's worth noting that SAR logs should be kept on a need to know basis. 
Um, so it shouldn't be accessible to everybody in the organisation. They should be confidential. So usually we see um, compliance teams, nominated officer, you know, need to know group of people. And obviously law enforcement, et cetera, should they request to see it. And then um, final point for me is avoiding the tipping off offence. Um, so tipping off essentially is where you tell somebody that you filed a SAR against them. And the reason why this is an offence is because if I was to tell Sally that I've, um, I'm really suspicious of her, I uh, think she's doing naughty things, she is going to run away and hide and she's going to move all of her money and she's going to go and do something different. It's going to basically give her rabbit in head headlights. Um, so it's really important that we don't do that, so that we don't hinder criminal investigations and we sort of like make everything normal. Um, the other reason we don't do that is because, as I sort of said in my, in my wording, it's not written on the slide, but tipping off is an offence. And that means that if you are found guilty of tipping off, you can face to three months in prison and slash or an unlimited fine. So definitely something to avoid there. I'm stop talking now <laughs> and hand over to Sally to talk about fraud. Um, do you want to do fraud and then if there's any questions at the end? Yeah, yeah. moving. Just clicking along. Oh, here we go. Um, hello. I'm going to talk about fraud, but I'm going to take it right back to the basics. So if you know a lot about fraud, I'll use the opportunity to pop to the loo if you need it, because this really is going to be about what the basics of fraud are. So apologies if anybody is well versed. Um, I'm not a criminal. I would be a brilliant criminal because I obviously am uh, well versed in fraud. Um, but my job is to try and break things and try and predict where fraud might happen. So what we do is, if it's okay with you, I'm going to kind of talk about some cases that I've investigated. They won't be. You won't necessarily think, oh, that is particularly um, in my area. But some of the cases that I will talk about are things that you might go, oh yeah, it could happen. It might happen. Or I know somebody who that happened to. And it's just understanding. How, what it looks like so that we can look at it in your business. So I'll talk about the fraud triangle in a minute. So hi, we'll hide that. So um, now you have to apologise for myself. I've got dairy focals on, which means I can't see that very well. So I'm going to have to stand here. Um, so that's the definition of fraud under the Fraud Act. If I just go through all of this, that's it. There we go. So false representation is section two of the Fraud Act. And that basically means you are not who you say you are, or you are not what you say you are. And I, my shoes are really squeaky. That is definitely my shoes. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to stand still. Um, for false representation. So, in a case that I've looked at in a previous life, I was working with uh, the NHS for all the investigators, and we were alerted to a nurse who had been a nurse in this particular trust for 15 years. She had been loved by her colleagues, her, her patients really adored her, she was not an angel of death, and the trust changed hands and they did retrospective checks on everybody's qualifications. And it turns out she'd never passed her nursing exams. She'd, she'd falsely represented herself as a qualified nurse and for 15 years had been treating patients very well. They all loved her. She'd probably saved lives. She'd certainly seen people through some of their darkest times, but she was not a qualified nurse. And the trust reported it to the police. She was prosecuted and um, I think, if I remember correctly, had a jail sentence and had to repay her, her um, salary for the 15 years because she wasn't a nurse. Right? So that's, that's a really extreme case. But there are people out there that are falsely representing themselves as solicitors, accountants. So this is why things like employment checks and qualifications checks when you're onboarding new staff into your business especially into positions of authority, is really important. False representation isn't just about someone nicking your credit card and tapping it and going for a quick coffee, which is also pretending there to be somebody else. It's not always low level like that. Oh, one thing I'm not going to do is talk about figures. Don't even get me started on fraud figures because, they're, they're, because there's no UK or global definition of fraud, as in when it becomes money laundering, when it becomes fraud. The fraud figures can be cut so many different ways. We just know it's a lot, all right? So fraud is a lot. Failure to disclose. So I was working with a firm. I won't say who it was, but I was working with a firm who had um, were, were in the financial services industry, and they were new to the new to the market, and they had very very poor onboarding controls for their staff and their customers. But that's another story. But in particular, with their staff. So they were in interviews. 
two weeks later start, two weeks later front of office selling mortgages. It was absolutely bonkers crazy. And we had a report from a member of the public after this gentleman had um, started at this particular um, bank to say, Bob, over there, is a criminal. He was convicted for uh, um, perverting the course of justice. So we called Bob in and had a chat with him. And it turns out when Bob was, I always use Bob, Bob is not a real person. Uh, Bob, um, at 18, had been in a car accident with his mate who had been driving. And his mate didn't have any car insurance. So by the time the police came, Bob and his mate had said, oh, Bob, will you pretend you're driving so that we're not going to get done for all sorts of other things, including driving without insurance? And they all both agreed, got to court, and then witnesses in court were like, no, 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 Bob wasn't driving, Bob's mate was driving. So he was done for perverting the course of justice. Roll forward a couple of years, he's got a job in this bank, and he has... He has an undeclared, failed to disclose, criminal conviction. Now, the bank, in this particular case, chose to give him the benefit of the doubt. But like, OK, he was 18, he, he made a mistake, he's, he's kind of put his hand up and he's, he's accepted that. And he's still there. Well, for like 10 years later, he's still with this bank. And a little bit of me is like, mm, I don't think I like it very much because he hasn't committed <clears throat> fraud. But they took, they, the bank said, we're going to risk, risk rate this, we think it's OK, he's been with us a couple of months, he's OK. But they put him on an extended probation. But similarly, when you are doing your onboarding of staff, don't rush it through. You know, if you're really desperate for staff, it's not worth the risk of onboarding somebody who is potentially a fraudster or potentially a criminal, right? And if you're a position, um, someone asked me at a charity seminar like this a few years ago, who I would be most suspicious about in a company if there was fraud. And I said, what role do you have? And he said, oh, I'm the finance director. And I said, oh, you, definitely. <laughs> because you, 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 you're in charge of the finances. And it comes from a, a case back in 2008, and you can Google this. Um, I worked at HSBC, and there were, as, as you know, it's an enormous organisation. There were various heads of fraud of different parts of the business and blah, blah, blah. So I finally in a global head of fraud prevention role with other 40, 40 people. And then I came into work one day and my boss, Derek Wild, best man on earth, amazing. He said to me, Richard Crawford has been arrested for fraud. Richard Crawford was head of fraud for First Direct. We all know who First Direct are, right? Massive, massive part of HSBC, massive brand in the UK, arrested for fraud. And he was tried, convicted, and sent to prison for fraud. And he was in a head of fraud role. And I'll talk a little bit later about the cost of fraud. But it was a massive thing for us. He had got into, um, he'd fallen on hard times, let's say. He was going through a divorce. He was um, gambling and he was addicted to drugs. And my worry with him, he completely abused his position. He was getting staff to override loans. He was um, redirecting funds. My, my problem with, with Richard was his boss hadn't spotted the change of behaviour. Um, and when I talk, when I come and do training with, Firms like you all work with, when I talk to you know uh, people managers and do fraud risk training, an element of that is understand what your people are like, know what normal looks like. You'll have introverts and extroverts and bullies and people who won't take holidays and all of these other people working for you. If that's their normal behaviour, fine. You just got to get on with it. But if that behaviour changes, that quite often can mean they've got some financial problems, they're having some issues, and that can often become um, a precursor to digital material in your business. So we talk about the full triangle. This is the full triangle. It's a very old model and it does it still stands stands up. You might see motive on some of the models as pressure. I always put motive because quite often fraudsters are just greedy. And I don't believe greed is a pressure. Right? It's a motive, but it's not pressure. The pressure might be being blackmailed. You've got, you know, in, in South America when I worked there, tiger kidnaps actually a thing. Um, so the motive is completely out of your control as employers, as firms. You can't control people's motive for committing fraud. Nor can you commit, can you really control their rationalisation. If your kind-hearted, good bosses, it's really hard for people to rationalise committing fraud against you. If you're awful to work for, then they'll be like, I don't care, they owe it. Someone else has got a pay rise instead of me. The area under your control within a firm, whether it's your suppliers, whether it's your customers or your staff, is opportunity. That's where your control sits. 
you can't you absolutely can't tell somebody how to feel or think or rationalize things but you can control their opportunity to commit fraud so i might want to commit all the fraud in the world and i might be really hacked off with my boss because they're an ass uh, idiot <laughs> apologies i will say to people don't swear but you know what i mean right okay it might be awful to work for really really skin having real problems at home but if you don't provide me the opportunity to commit fraud you never give me the keys to the safe you never give me both parts of the dual control i can't commit it because i don't have the opportunity so that's where it's really important as firm to get your controls right i put down here um the act the fraud act states that you have to have dishonesty which is really hard to prove I can't get in your brain and say to you, six months ago when you clicked that button, you knew what you were doing, you were intentionally moved the money. Intent is really difficult to prove. And that's why 2% of, of, uh, of police forces have fraud investigators. It's a, it's a high crime, low investigation and really low conviction rate. Um, but the, the, it's about being dishonest because people do click the wrong button accidentally. It does happen. Fraud is a cost of doing business. Fraud will be occurring in most if not all of your businesses in some way shape or form to give you an example of something that you may not think of as fraud it's a cultural thing and fraud is top down culture culture led i worked with a, a glass and bottle manufacturer a few years ago um you all have their products at home i had no idea who they were and they said i oh, would make for Del Rio, we make gin bottles it was like oh wow okay because i was like surely bob by sapphire just made their own bottles of course they don't they have suppliers for that um and this company was about 20,000 people, 16,000 of whom were in the shop floor, clocking in and clocking out with an old fashioned punch card. For those of you too young to remember, they like bits of paper with braille on them and it just, anyway, it was a really, so I said to the firm, let's, let's work through a model because they were absolutely convinced they had no fraud at all in their business, which is always my favorite thing to hear from a client. I don't know fraud. Um, so I said, right, okay, 4,000 of your staff commit one hour a week fraud at minimum wage by getting their mates to clock them in early on a Friday or out late on a, on, a, on a Monday and out late on a Friday. One hour a week, about eight quid, roll it up, that's a million and a half pounds a year you're losing in wages that you that people aren't entitled to. And the point of this story is the head of the head of um, the finance that I was working with, Treasury head, he said to me, I don't believe people would do it. Why would anyone bother for 35 pounds a week? Uh, for 35 pounds a month and i said right okay 35 pounds a month to somebody on minimum wage is fish and chip money on payday it's kids going to the pictures it's taking the wife out for a nice dinner it's, it's luxury money and he was so far removed from the shop floor he couldn't get his head around why anyone would do it and the control was easy fingerprint facial recognition as you come in the boxes are about 400 pound put them in you either reduce your wage bill by a million and a half pounds a year or you increase productivity because everyone's used to getting the money so understand a different example and i get that none, none of you have twenty thousand staff factory environment but my point is understanding how fraud might look in your business it may not be a business email compromise it might be slightly different i worked with a property management company a few years ago and they their peers in the market had had a near miss ceo fraud you know like oh why we change bank accounts please pay us for about a million pounds and they and they they shared that information and Clorinda talked about the importance of collaboration share your stories with each other because then this the new agency got me in and said come and talk to us come and have a look where are we where have we got problems everyone's in an open plan office everyone had access to everything nothing was on password protected there was no call leave policy so lots of people were having no time off at all big red flag for me if you're somebody who doesn't want any time off, what are you doing? Why, why, why are you not signing up on board? So there's lots of um, behavioural things, and this comes all, all led by abuse of position. Okay, types of fraud. Well, I don't, I don't. Okay, two broad categories. Internal fraud, i.e., your staff are committed, and they, some of them will be. Sorry, they will be claiming expenses they're not entitled to. They will be running up mileage that they, they haven't had. That, that will be happening and this comes back down to opportunities and controls and external fraud the a, a business email compromise fraud i mean dear, dear ceo the invoice i said to you has got the wrong bank account details having controls in there for that's about fraud awareness training understanding how that might look um supply chain fraud into external fraud can be supply chain or customer customers are going to be committing fraud as well i expect um so 
um, recruitment and qualification form. Really important <clears> for those parts of your business where you genuinely have to have a qualification to do the job. Make sure that the staff have, have I've worked with lots of firms who have got accountants on board who aren't accountants. That, that's fine if you're happy to take that risk. But I'm slightly uncomfortable with the fact that they've declared that they are something they're not. Um, it's about your risk appetite on there. I'm rattling through because I'm just conscious of time. Okay, we talked a little bit about the cost of fraud, and I talked about all of these. Um, the, the financial loss, if you had a business email compromise fraud for a million pounds, yeah, great. You're going to lose a million pounds in fraud because you probably aren't going to get that money back. You're going to probably want to get investigated in because it's un unlikely that you've got investigators in-house. So that comes at cost. The investigators might go, do you know what, we probably should take this to the police. And then you've suddenly got litigation costs as well with that. So it's all already become more than the fraud of itself. And you've got the cost of training and rehiring, rehiring and training, assuming that you fired the person that's committed the fraud or you're, if it's an internal job. Reputational, it's a really tough one because I work with firms who go, we march everybody out the front door. Customer, member of staff, doesn't matter who, we arrest, we get the police in, we march them out the front door make a big thing of it and, they, in, and it's a deterrent in a lot of ways and I work with other firms who go oh no just shuffle them out the back door don't talk about it don't go on any registers and there are internal fraud registers you can you can become members of CIFAS to register staff that commit fraud and make sure you don't hire people who commit fraud um, and the adverse media that comes with marching out the front door versus not saying anything and it hits the press I'm not sure which is better or worse and I can see both points Startups are quite often the ones who go, yeah, we march them out the front door, we're setting our stall out really early. And the bigger boys, the bigger companies are sometimes a little bit reluctant to say, do you know what? We've had a fraud and we've dealt with it and this is what we've done and this is what we've put in place. So you have to think about how, how your appetite for dealing with it, where it sits on that scale. Um, the regulatory piece, if you are regulated, it's, it's really unusual, really different to money laundering and the financial crime rates, because fraud is best practice. Within the FCA's guidelines, their, their guidelines, we'd really like you to have some fraud detection systems. What they're not going to do is say how good they are. They're not going to say, we expect you to recover X percent of your losses each year, because the, the banks or the companies who are regulated and have risk appetites, they set that themselves. They go, right, well, we're, we're happy to lose £10 million in fraud this year. And they come in at eight million. They're like, "Woo, we have spent two million. You still lost eight million. You're not co concentrate on the loss of the eight million. And then the next year they go, "I copied out. Let's go up to twelve. And then it goes up. And it's like, guys, sort this this out first for control because you're still hemorrhaging money. Um, and until the regulator and the government have some focus on fraud, that's 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 sort of going to be the attitude. There is a lot of focus in the government. There's an article in The Guardian from yesterday you can read about fraud reporting and how action fraud are failing to investigate a lot of fraud, which then makes me think most of it probably isn't being reported. The 299 come and come and pay this and come and collect your parcel text that we've all had from the Royal Mail. We won't have clicked on it. We all really know, Sally. Some people will have clicked on that. Hundreds of people will have clicked on that. But they're not going to report that to action fraud. It's 299. And they got a parcel the next day and they're like, okay. Fine. So it's not making the link that it would have arrived anyway. And then the internal cost. Now, roll back to Richard Crawford, the head of fraud at First Direct. That case happened in 2008, and he's, he's dead now. Um, I don't think that. I don't think prison was. Uh, I wasn't say didn't suit him, but that sounds awful. But he didn't do well coming out of prison, and he passed away a couple of years ago. And I, I still know lots of staff at First Direct, and they say that when new joiners come in, they still want to know if this is the place where Richard Crawford was the head of fraud, and is this where that happened? 15 years later. So the, the cost of fraud is much more than just that million pound loss. You've got the whole reputational piece, but even down to years later, that stigma of being, oh, well, do you know what happened here? And my friends at First Direct have said, senior people left. Senior people were really disheartened with how the process um, was allowed to happen, going back to that performance management piece. The boss of Richard was interested in how his tasks were doing, how is how is the operation performing, rather than how are you doing? And my colleagues will know I'm all about the people, because if you get the people management right, 
the rationalization and the motive stuff on the full triangle and you've already got your controls in place you're going to reduce your loss of pool if you're nice people to work for if you're good people to work for if you treat yourself nicely and you understand what motivates people to come to work every day they will be rogue employees there will be people that rip you off it happens it's, it, it's unfortunate but it's about how you deal with it as well so an anti-fraud frame, fraud framework is really very it's very easy and it won't cost you loads of money okay it's, it's about the tank from the top <clears throat> what do your board and the exco or however big your company is the bloke at the top the woman at the top how does she or he deal with fraud is it on their agenda can you articulate that every time the senior people meet that agenda has got fraud as a standing item even if it's have we got anything no do we think you said it yeah okay fine prove to me that it's it, that you're thinking about it um assessing the risk understanding what your risk is across your business have you had fraud losses if you have have you spoken to your mates in other industries in, in other um your peer group sorry who might be useful to have that information to put some controls in place Assign responsibility. I worked with people who go, oh, I just, I just want to fraud. Great, it's on your job description. Make sure if you have fraud in your job description or you're going to give responsibility to fraud to somebody, tell them. Have a plan. Have a fraud response plan about in knowing how you would react to fraud if it happens. It's no good going into one of your stores or shops and going, uh, okay, how do you do you know how you would report fraud? And your your colleagues go, I've got a clue, I've probably said, no, it happens a lot. Have that response plan easily accessible. We talked about clear and concise language in the SARS. Clear and concise fraud response plan. Here you go, it's part of the fraud policy, or here you go, it's on the internet, it's on the back of the toilet doors. If you're suspicious of anything, these are the people you speak to. If one of the people you speak to is the person you're suspicious about, go to another person. And that's happened before, right? You're suspicious of your boss, where do you go? So it might be HR, it might be compliance, it might be a, a legal representative, representative, but somebody within your business needs to be allocated with, if we get fraud, you, you are the person it comes to or you deal with it and you have a response plan built on that. Training and awareness, I've spoken about that. It's me or somebody like me or somebody coming in and going, right, what might happen? This is what it might look like. This is how we react to it. And this is how we respond to it. And then we go and I say, learn and go again. If it happens, you go, okay, all right, we'll learn from it, go back to the top. And then you go, right, we've had a fraud, forward. This is what's happened. How do we do it? How do we assess if it could happen again? How do we make sure people are aware of it? It's not, it's not rocket If it was rocket science, I wouldn't be doing it. It's really not rocket science. Any questions? That's it. Any questions? And I'm happy to do some. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Clarinda. So we just do have a, a couple of minutes. Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to, to raise with Clarinda and Sally? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so with the kind of increased focus in AML checks, like in the property industry, and where it's deemed that commercial agents are providing accountancy services regarding service charge tenants, What's kind of the scope of responsibility for AML checks on tenants? That's a good question. <laughs> um, can, I, can I extend that to include sanctions checks on tenants as well? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you want me to take it from there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, my turn there. Um, yeah, it's a really difficult one. And, and at the moment, it's the, the property sector is, is probably an underlooked sector in terms of regulatory pressure. Um, I think for me, it always goes back to risk appetite because there's nothing necessarily black and white in 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 guidance that that you can sort of hang your hat on. Um, it's kind of the firm's risk appetite. So I'm kind of almost taking what Sally just said about fraud, thinking that two steps ahead. Right, if something were to go wrong, how comfortable would you be that you took the right steps and you operated within um, within a sort of an appetite that your firm is comfortable with? Um, it's often a case by case basis um, and then clearly I'm sorry your question originally was about money laundering and then we tacked on a bit about sanctions. Um, sanctions at the moment is such a difficult one to keep up with right because it's changing constantly um, the position I think there's been more sanction property Russia related in the last couple of weeks. Um, it's it's very very challenging to kind of keep up with that rolling dynamism and then actually going okay well um, this is happening now, but does this mean we need to do a massive look back about what wasn't happening two weeks ago that's now um, that's now happening? 
Um, so I'd link it all back to sort of um, understanding what your risk exposure is, mapping out what potentially could go wrong, and sort of designing um, either a money laundering or sanctions compliance um, framework. Uh, risk based approach that kind of maps to that. Sorry, that wasn't meant to be a woolly answer, but it's very difficult when there's nothing sort of hard and fast in regulation. Yeah, uh, I also have another question. Yeah. So, when we're trying to, we're looking to kind of automate, automate allocation of receipts, kind of using references such as tendency reference invoice numbers, mm -hmm. but you then may get an issue with acceptable payers or, or payee names that are different. Or, and you talked about kind of SARS required as soon as practically possible. So if you, what is the scope of that exception checks in terms of acceptable payers? Yeah, so um, it, obviously you're not going to be able to spot everything. We do completely understand that. Um, I, in terms of names that are a bit similar, there's definitely technology out there that can sort of like fuzzy matching that can be set to identify similarities. And you can set the threshold of how, how similar or dissimilar that, that captures so that you can sort of um, generate um, alerts or pop-ups or whatever to, to try and ident identify those, then human intervention can come in and go, okay, actually, is this reasonable? Um, lots of firms have those sort of ticking over in the background, whether that's almost like a daily scrub or a weekly scrub, again, depending on your risk appetite. I think then in terms of the second part of your question about submitting SARS as soon as practicable, um, that sort of element for me and my take on it tends to be when when the entity has um, been alerted to and become alive to that suspicion. So even though, yes, your systems might pick up something and do a scrub once a week, okay, on that day seven when they have picked something up, have you then left it for three weeks? Or have you actually gone out, right, we need to look into this today or, or next business day or whatever? What impact do you see the new regulation of um, overseas entities registered having? on our sector, both from a regulated and unregulated? Um, yeah, it's a really, really interesting one. Um, and I think uh, there's going to be, it, this is my view, by the way, this is probably best to say not a video, not because I'm going to say anything controversial, but just because I can't necessarily speak on, on behalf of everybody, but I think there's going to be a lot of backlash. I think a lot of overseas entities don't want um, to have to disclose things, there's going to be a lot of loopholes. Um, so a couple of years ago, when the Criminal Finances Act came in in 2017, we saw the same thing. Um, so um, law enforcement being able to go out and get undisclosed wealth orders. Um, so that means, I think there was the, the, the I can't remember her name, but um, Iranian lady in Harrods who went to send like 10 million or something. And I think they've only had since then like two or three cases where they've actually been able to use this tool to go back and, and sort of um, investigate people. So I think I think in principle, it's really great. I think obviously it's heading in the right direction. I think in practice, there's probably gonna be a bit of bedding in time and it's gonna be a, a little bit of time before we actually see any real effects. And I think if you're somebody who's happy to be transparent, it's no problem, but if you're trying to be non-transparent for illicit purposes, you're going to try and do whatever you can to continue to, to sort of mask your own shit structure. Okay. Miranda, um, I think that does bring us towards the, the end now of our session. So um, can I just say a massive thank you to Sally and Clarinda um, for your presentation today. Um, and also, I would like to just say a personal thank you to Alex and Sue um, from BDO for organising our event today and leading up to today. Um, it's been fantastic success. And also a really big thank you to you all for coming along today. Great to see you in person. Um, we will be holding future events. We will collect your feedback. Please do share with us via the link. You will get copies of the slides as well. Um, and we are lining up um, another event in January. Dates and details will be following, um, and that will be to launch our prop cost benchmarking um, product, which you'll find out more about in the coming weeks. So um, really lovely again to see you all in person today. Thank you so much, and we'll see you very soon. <laughs>